how are you? Yeah, no, I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Perfect. So we are now. Um, Sorry for everyone uh, watching. We just had a technical issue, and we're glad that Steve is joining us uh, from Australia. It's really early in Australia now. Um, yeah, about seven o'clock. Yeah. So no worries, Steve. It's so lovely to have you on the on the webinar series. So I will start right in um, with welcoming everyone, and um, let's start. Okay. Yeah. Great. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Okay. Uh, so welcome Beast Builders to the Together for Peace webinar series. On this webinar, we connect and create a community of shared values and aspirations for peace. We do this by bringing to you the most inspiring Beast Builders from around the world to motivate and help you take action for peace today. Before I start, I would like to thank the amazing production team, Anna De Selva, Ani Zaman, and Daniel Hollis for their exceptional work. I also would like to thank RAGFP members, dedicated audience, and RAGFP leadership for their support. Now, it's time to welcome today's amazing guest, Steve Galilee. Uh, Steve embodies a true person of action. He is a spiritual being who applies his wisdom, talents, and values to impact the world. As an entrepreneur in the high technology industry, Steve founded and built one of Australia's leading publicly listed IT companies. Through Steve's direction as CEO and then chairman, um, chairperson, his company IR has an impressive world-class customer base and its software is used by many of the world's top organizations in more than 50 countries. With a compassionate heart, he established the Charitable Foundation over 20 years ago. The nonprofit now has over 3 million beneficiaries and is now one of the largest private overseas aid organizations. They provide life-changing programs to some of the poorest communities in the world, including emergency and famine relief, environmental rehabil rehabilitation, and rehabilitating formal, former child so soldiers. Over the last two decades, Steve has applied his business skills and deep compassion to establish the Institute for Economics and Peace, IEP. IEP's mission is to measure and communicate the economic value of peace. IEP is a highly impactful nonprofit and nonpartisan research institute. It is known for innovative analysis on the relationship between business, peace, and economic development used by many international organizations, including the United Nations and the World Bank. As the leading think tank measuring peacefulness, IEP's research has made a global headlines on prestigious publications such as Forbes, CNN, and The Guardian. The Global Peace Index, a product of IEP, has been praised and endorsed by the Dalai Lama and Jimmy Carter. Steve's deep commitment to peace has earned him two Nobel Peace Prize nominations. He is a sought after international speaker has received many international awards and is regularly quoted in the media on various subjects, including business, global peacefulness, terrorism, and social development. I am honored to have Steve as a friend and a role model. What I love about Steve is that he is tackling the complex challenges and overwhelming nature of bringing peace with a brilliant simplicity. Steve wakes up every day ready for the challenge to bring peace to all in his life, starting with himself. Let's dive deeper into Steve's fascinating world. So Steve, I'll start right away. Why, as a successful entrepreneur, have you decided to focus on peace as your mission? Well, in many ways, Rima was just accidental. Like most things in my life, things just seem to happen to me and it's a life's got its own velocity and direction, I suppose. But as you mentioned, uh, uh, we set up the Charitable Foundation, which is a family foundation to work with the poorest of the poor. So working with the poorest of the poor meant that we really spend a lot of place in war zones, near post war zones, because that's where a lot of the poorest of the poor are. And it was simply in northeast Kabul in the Congo, which is one of the more violent places in the world. And I was walking through there and I started to think, what? the opposite of all these stressed out nations I'm spending time in. What are the most peaceful nations in the world? And is there anything I could learn from them which I could bring into the projects which I was doing? So it's just a simple curiosity question. So when I got back from that trip, I then searched the internet 
and couldn't find a list listing which ranked the nations of the world by their peacefulness. I thought, wow, that's really important. So at that point, I thought, well, that's a pretty good question to uh, ask and answer. So it was really treating it as a project. And at the end of it, what I was going to do was develop the index, put it into a university and, and then fund it and then let them run it. But what happened is as I moved further on, I realised just how little we actually knew about peace. We spent a lot of time studying war, but not much time studying peace. And we'll come back to that later, I suppose, if you ask the right questions. But, <laughs> but to, uh, a, uh, that stage, then I thought, well, I want to pursue this further. So I couldn't actually really find a, a, a university where I was comfortable putting it because I could put it in there and they'd do the study, but they just didn't have the sense of marketing it, the sense of how to go about promoting it and all those kind of things, which I guess my entrepreneurial background had taught me. So from there, then I established the Institute for Economics and Peace. So that's basically how it came about. So classic, you know, classic entrepreneurial story. <laughs> yeah. So I gab in, uh, in, in uh, the world that is not failed and you wanted to fail it in a meaningful and impactful way. You didn't care just about answering the question, but also you wanted to market it, you wanted to make it popular and you wanted to take it forward. So why is then measuring peace is important? Why this idea is important? Why to measure peace in the first place? Well, it's really very, very simple. If you can't measure something, can you truly understand it? If you can't measure something, how do you know whether your actions are helping you or who are hindering you in achieving your goals? You just do not. And that's the basis. So if you can't rank the nations of the world by their peacefulness, how can you ever use statistical analysis to actually understand what creates peace? So do you, that's, that's really important. Um, so because, for example, you will, it's when we look at the index, we look how peacefulness deteriorates versus how it improves. So you refer to the measures. So how do you measure the Global Peace Index for people who are wondering? So, yeah, like measuring peace, that's an interesting topic. So how do you actually go about measuring peace? Well, Times have moved on, so we're going back 15 years ago now, and, and sort of the thought process has been very different than what they are now. So there's a lot of measurements of war then. But to, so there's great databases, some of them going back uh, hundreds of years, looking at the uh, war and conflicts. But whether you've got peace in a war setting, it's like a light switch. It's on or it's off. Either you're in war or you're not in war. And that's fine. As we look at the broader tapestry of peace, it comes a whole range of other things. So one is obviously ongoing conflict, but then you've got the internal dimensions with inside nations as well. We call that uh, your safety and security. So that's like homicide rates, violent crime, level of terrorism, state-sponsored terror on its citizens. How many police do you need to keep the country safe? How many people do you need to keep locked up to keep the country safe? And all these come together come together. So there's two domains, safety and security, ongoing conflict. And then we added a third, which was militarization. Because militarization reflects one of two things. One is you're fearful of your neighbors or other countries. So you need an adequate military to protect yourself. Or two, you want a military which you'll use to be assertive in your national interests. So what we did with the Global Peace Index has come up with three domains, ongoing conflict, safety and security, and militarization. Now we bring them again together, harmonize them to create one unified measure. And that's a pretty comprehensive measure. But to get there, the key thing is you need a definition. And the definition then will determine what you actually measure. So our definition was simple. It's the absence of violence or fear of violence. Now, most people agree with that as a reasonable definition of peace. But, so what it does, but by using that definition, it gives us the ability to rank the nations of the world by their peacefulness, but it doesn't tell us anything about how they become peaceful. Yeah, so what is a better measure to 
understand what makes a country peaceful or a community peaceful? Well, this is it. So depending on what you try, what what you're interested in trying to achieve will determine your definition, and then your definition will determine what you measure. <clears throat> so the Global Peace Index is a measure of what's called negative peace, if you like, and that's a great starting point for developing peace. So what we did then was we decided to understand what are those qualities most closely associated with highly peaceful societies. And that is called positive peace. And we borrowed that from uh, Johann Bultung, who coined the phrase uh, uh, sometime in the 70s. And so to get there, this is the real innovation in the work here. To get there, what we did is we did statistical analysis against other data sets indexes attitudinal surveys to understand the factors most statistically associated with highly peaceful societies. So we've got something like 50,000 different data sets uh, now which are uh, harmonised at a national level down here and we just run these uh, programs against that to spit out everything which is statistically associated. We then use four other statistical techniques for clumping and so we can now take them, get rid of things which are measuring basically the same thing, and then put them down into different groups. And from that, we come up with an eight part topology, which we call the pillars of positive peace. And they're the, thing, and they're the things which actually create the highly peaceful societies. But it's a lot more than that. And that, I think for me, this is what's profound, absolutely profound. So as we started then look at the pillars of peace, or positive peace, what we found <coughs> is that <coughs> the same qualities which made for highly peaceful societies also made for a whole lot of other things which we thought were really important, like higher GDP growth. So for example, countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries which are deteriorating, on average, have three times higher GDP growth rates. Yeah. It's also associated with a whole range of other things, better better measures of well-being or happiness. Uh, perform, the countries higher in positive peace perform better on measures of eco ecology and a whole range of other things too. So from that, we then coined the phrase, a uh, positive peace describes the optimal environment for human potential to flourish. And that's really powerful. Even as we're just, we're doing research now into the year, uh, uh, the COVID-19, uh, uh, responses and what we're and there's not enough data to really get really good stuff yet but we can by looking at the OECD nations find that the countries which had the worst responses quite often have the lowest positive peace now it's not that these countries have low positive peace but compared to the OECD average so for example Spain and Italy they've got probably the two worst responses in Europe the US, for example, which I know is where you're sitting now, the US, for example, has had one of the largest drops in positive peace of any nation in the world in the last decade. And you can see it's playing out in the fragmentation within the politics in the country and trying to deal with the uh, yeah, with the with the with the virus. This this conversation, Steve, um, takes my mind into the concept of peace and security. Um, so basically when you are your strategies to focus on security as a definition of peace is different than when you think about society as a thriving community that can fulfill a potential can you elaborate on this tension or this history of understanding peace and framing it and how um, ieps has improved that concept and, and and kind of made this shift shifted the needle so security is a very very shriveled idea of peace and security is very very important so don't get me wrong uh, we might, even if it's a shriveled concept of peace we'd much sooner live with security than insecurity so and like so and so security is important but what security ignores is a lot of the basic concepts let's say human rights so you find that's out that, that that's out the window it relies on force to be able to uh, yeah, impl imp implement peace, rather than the social structures, which actually create an environment where less violence arises in the first place. And so I think 
some ways, I think that sort of gets at the nut of the difference between the two. Yeah. And so that makes me also think about systems thinking and how we think about positive peace. So um, I was, I'm from Palestine originally. So my experience really dictates how I interpret some of your ideas. Um, I was thinking about the Oslo Accords and how they failed because yes, people say that leaders should meet and relationships and collaboration at leadership level would create peace. And it does in many cases, and it's really important strategy. But the question I've had, is that enough? Because the, the Oslo Accords failed because the Israelis and the Palestinian populations did not support the leadership because they operate in a completely different way than um, in, in like that would advance peace than what leadership um, uh, strategy is. So can you elaborate on system thinking in light of that example and how? Uh, well, can yeah. yeah. So first up, I'd say I'm not an expert on the Israel-Palestinian conflict, so I won't go too far into that. But if we're looking at positive peace, it consists of eight pillars. So they're things like well-functioning government, strong business environment, equitable distribution of resources, free flow of information, high levels of human capital, good relationships with neighbours, equitable distribution of resources, and acceptance of the rights of others. So now, all of them come together to create a system. So you really need all of them really working and working working well. And so just give you, just give you an idea. So let's see, look at well-functioning government, low levels of corruption and free flow of information. So if you want, so all those we can see are important, but does government regulates free flow of information? The free flow of information now affects people's perception of whether there is corruption or not. Uh, corruption undermines well-functioning government, but government has the ability to regulate corruption as well and corruption will impede on the free flow of information. So you can see you can't unlock any of them and you can see that for all eight. So if we go back to let's say the Israel-Palestinian uh, uh, example, for example, so you've got the workings at the top, but between the two societies you really need to be able to get all these other things going. Sort of having a functioning business environment's really key because that provides the taxation. Taxation then gives the money so you can focus on things like health systems, education systems, which then you can see as proxies for equitable distribution of resources. High levels of human capital, as people get more educated, for example, they're better able to analyze and understand the environment in which they live because knowledge is just broader and we could Keep, keep going. So free flow of information, you've got to get the right information into both populations so that they can see the benefits of a peace deal. And I imagine the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, many people on both sides couldn't see the benefits of a peace deal. No, and that's, that's really profound um, understanding of this because um, a lot of people are stuck in security and these um, outdated concepts when we just communicate that to people and we don't give them the full picture. Like you said, we're not changing the attitudes. We are not changing the structures or the systems in place that would push for a peaceful outcome that we would all aspire to see. So I want to ask you um, a little bit more about IEP. Um, so IEP's mission, as I've alluded to it in the intro, is to measure and communicate the economic value of peace. So how does the IEP mission play out in the real world and advance peace action? Can you share an example of um, such an initiative um, that people took forward because of IEP's work and um, research? Yeah, look, there's dozens and dozens of examples and obviously Rotary is a classic one, which I'm sure most of the people who are on this call are familiar with, but I'll park that aside at the moment, Marine, because I know you want to come back to it. So, uh, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you, give you a couple, couple of examples, okay. So look, if we look at the work now, it's included in thousands of university courses around the world, especially peace and conflicts, international relations, uh, 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 social sciences. So they're the areas where, where it's big. It's also 
Look, even in, I live in New South Wales, which is one of the states of Australia, and Australia's got seven states, about 8 million people in New South Wales. The uh, books which they use in secondary school here, they've got the Global Peace Index in them. So what that does, it just propagates the concept of peace through the education system. So another example, more recently, we've been engaged with in the Philippines, so in Mindanao. So Mindanao is a, a, is a group of islands in the uh, yeah, southern Philippines, which have got about 24, 26 million people. So it's a decent size. They've, they've been having a, 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 a civil insurrections there now for a long while. Yeah. And now uh, they recently did a, a, a peace deal down there. Uh, and now they've used the pillars of positive peace and the pillars of positive peace is the mechanism to implement the peace deal in Mindanao. And that was so successful that earlier this year, uh, would have been February, that the, uh, yeah, yeah, they brought in all the representatives for all the governors of all the provinces in the Philippines and the Minister for the Interior uh, to see what was happening down there, have a two day workshop around positive peace and the back end of it, the decision was to take it and roll it out nationally is the, the mechanism to try and uh, e, 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 counter, uh, uh, counter the various civil insurrections they got going in many parts of the country. And as the president, uh, yeah, President Duterte said, and there's a lot of comments we could make about him, but on this occasion, a, 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 the president came out and says, says well, look, we've been using, a, 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 using a force to try and a, a solve these insurrections for 45 years. Hasn't worked. Time to do something different. That's very cool. That, thanks for sharing this great example. It's like, um, so speaking, because you alluded to Rotary, let's go the, about that. Um, we are in, in the business of empowering grassroots and activating grassroots and basically communities. So, and positive peace is a, an ideal uh, framework because it's based on systems thinking of how we can activate communities. So how does IEP and Rotary collaborate around uh, positive peace? And can you share with us some of the work you've done with Rotary and Rotarians that is advancing peace. Sure. So we've been talking about peace. This, yes, we'll get this. Get right here. There's a lot here we can talk about, right? A lot. Yes. So it's a, it's a we, relaxed conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay. So what we've been doing so far has been talking about peace. And we've been talking at the geopolitical level, the national level, and what national leaders can do. But. Positive pieces can also be applied down in a, a, a setting, in a, a really classic developmental setting, even in rural environments. And so you can take, because it's, it works systemically, you can take the eight pillars of positive peace and you can apply it then to any project. And I'm going to give you an example now, which came out, came out of Rotary. So one of the uh, very first uh, yeah, yeah, exercises we did with Rotary, and this was a trial to see how it would go, was in uh, Kampala in Uganda. So pulled in a couple of hundred uh, uh, yeah, rotor actors and, and spent uh, yeah, three days training them uh, around positive peace. And then there was about a year later, there was a follow-up session to it as well. And one of the uh, yeah, yeah, men who was in the uh, in that course then went away and was working on a project out in one of the really poor parts of the uh, Uganda, and it was a literacy project done through one of the local uh, yeah, Rotary clubs. I think it was the uh, Sisi, Sisi Islands, the uh, yeah, Rotary club, which is part of Kampala. And they've been out 18 months and like, they hadn't really got anywhere with the literacy. But after he'd done the second training session on positive peace, he got it. So he went back to the school and said, look, let's look at, the, look at this and look at it holistically. So what they did is they looked for an intervention which had come through from each of the eight pillars with the idea of stimulating the system 
the system in this case is considered the school. So now there were things, so things like, let's say, low levels of corruption that formed a committee to make sure that anything which was donated to the school was still there and then made sure they put stamps on everything they put in. Well-functioning government was, well, let's involve some of the uh, uh, elders in the local community so that we've got their buy-in for re this literacy project and the way it works, because this area is poor, and I'll get to an example of this, which is which were just, just, just amazing. But there were two interventions particularly which worked really well, really well. And so the first was acceptance of the rights of others. So the girl, a lot of the girls weren't coming to school for four days a month because that's when they menstruated. So what they did is they introduced a, a, a program where they'd give the uh, free sanitary pads. That then boosted the uh, attendance rate of the school for the girls and also the scholastic rates because now they're a lot more keen to actually study and learn. Mm. Now, the second one, this is the one which really made a difference, okay? And you never pick it unless you apply systems thinking and with some sort of framework with good relationships with neighbours. Who'd think that the school wouldn't have a good relationship with neighbours? But that wasn't true here. What happened was, this was in a rural setting and it's incredibly poor. So what would happen is the kids at lunchtime would go out into the neighbouring uh, orchards and uh, uh, farms and raid uh, uh, the fruit trees to get uh, food to eat. And this was creating real conflict with the, uh, all the uh, uh, farmers around the school because in this environment, every apple, every orange really counts. Yeah. So what they did, was implemented a program where they'd grow fruit trees in the yard and then introduced a porridge feeding program at lunchtime for the kids. And so this only costs cents per person per day. It's a, believe me, it's, it's not expensive. So in starvation conditions these days, you can keep someone alive nutritionally for about 30 cents a day. So the one porridge meal in the middle of the day is much, much less than that. So we're talking sub 10 cents a person. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened then is suddenly the attendance rates of the school doubled. Wow. Doubled. That's because the parents now could see that there was one less meal that they had to provide the kids with. Wow. More often, these kids weren't going to school because that just scrounged to get enough food to eat for themselves. So. We're talking real poverty here. Wow. Now, that then uh, more than actually it was more than double. I've forgotten the exact rate, but it was well over 100 percent increase in the attendance rate at the school. But more importantly, what was happening was that if we looked at the grades within the district, only 30 percent of the kids were getting in the uh, top two grades. After the implementation of these programs, 60% of the kids were getting in the top two grades. Wow. And the main, main reason was the kids would go to school but because they didn't have the right nutritional capacity. The brains are flagging by lunchtime. The food at lunch meant that they had the nutritional values, so the brains kept functioning in the afternoon, which meant they learned better. <laughs> Quite, a, quite amazing, isn't it? Quite amazing. It is really amazing. It, uh, it makes me think about our current situation in the world today, COVID-19, and how many children around the world, um, the poor communities where they get their meals, are no longer going to get their meals. Um, so in light of the, this growing trend of peace and equality, it's, very, it's underreported trend that you and IEP found about peace and equality, with COVID-19 and this example, this profound example of people not being able to get their even meals because of the social isolation, for example, policy. So how does, um, how does the world look like now or in the future, like in, in terms of um, the framework of positive peace and peace and equality? Like how can you think about peace and equality and COVID-19? What what can you tell us what are the trends oh, that you're concerned about yeah, yeah. so if we're looking at what what we'd say is the growing one of the phrases we've termed is the growing inequality in peace so 
if we look at the 25 most peaceful nations in the world over the last decade, they've got slightly more peaceful. Like I think it's about a one and a half, two percent. If we look at the 25 least peaceful nations, they've become about 12 percent less peaceful. So and that's what we refer to as this growing inequality of peace. And so that's that's really, really, really quite profound, really quite profound. Now, so I think when we're looking looking at this, this comes across in all sorts of the different ways. So as countries become less peaceful, they're less capable of being able to look after their citizens' basic needs. So as COVID-19 comes in, you've got a whole lot of wicked choices, absolutely wicked choices for a lot of these governments. So they can lock the country down, but because most people, as we, the example I just gave from Uganda there, a lot of people, the, uh, what they eat that night is, comes from the money they earn that day. So it's a, it's a hand to mouth existence. So you lock them down, now, what happens is they haven't got the ability to be able to get the food they need to feed themselves that night. Mm. Now, uh, uh, so that has profound flow on effects. So that comes into the food chain. So people, it's a lot harder to find places then to store the food, a lot harder to get people to work on the fields to actually develop the food. So you have this ongoing chain of events which happen. Now, a lot of these governments, too, are really, uh, how can I put it, uh, they're highly in debt. So if we're looking at uh, yeah, 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 sub-Saharan Africa, I think it's about $700 uh, billion of debt. So it's, now as their economies get stretched further, it makes it harder and harder for them to repay. That obviously leads to the need for debt debt relief from the IMF and other countries. And I think there's a group, currently there's pledges at the moment for about $60 billion in relief of debt, but that doesn't go far over 700 billion. So you've got these compounding effects which will go on. Also, if you move into these situations too, it's sort of the COVID-19, it's gonna sort of be unsettled. Uh, a political stability uh, in all sorts of countries. We haven't really seen it in the West yet. It will come, it will come. Yes, we've got an economic shock, which is gonna come on the back of this. And that economic shock will compound a whole, whole range of different issues which we've seen. So if you're looking at civil unrest, globally, it's been on the increase in the last decade. Uh, uh, it, not so much in the States, surprisingly, and civil unrest is the uh, demonstrations, uh, uh, riots, uh, and uh, uh, general strikes. So that, that'd be the way we classify civil unrest. But in Europe, that's, uh, that's increased something like tenfold in the last decade, the number of demonstrations, riots. Just think of the yellow vests in France and how much time that's been running. But that's a trend which has been going on around the world over the last decade. So we'd expect that to, once the lockdowns are finished, because the, we've found that the demonstrations and riots have actually dropped by 90% during this period, that once the restrictions are lifted, we'd expect that now to take off, particularly as people start to get critical of maybe the government's responses to the economic, to the economic crisis, which we can see is coming after. So even in the, U, in the US, the level of unemployment now is, is at record levels. So if we look at just the registration for unemployment benefits, last month, a month before last, they're up six million in a one month. That's the largest increase which has been since the Second World War. Wow. So yeah. this, uh, the impact of COVID-19 is really reshaping our world at the economic, social, uh, political, um, even in development. Um, so there's, there must be something um, that Rotarians can do in terms of like the helping the most vulnerable at this time and Rotary has started a fund. Uh, so what would what do you think is the best thing Rotarians or development or the UN World Bank can do to help people um, it, the most vulnerable the people who suffer from this um, 
vulnerability and um, lack of resilience to this shock, how can they, yeah, what's the smart project or initiatives that they can do? So the Charitable Foundation, uh, we've take, we're taking all aid over the next six months in, for any projects we haven't started. What we're going to do uh, uh, is direct all the money to emergency famine relief. So that's food. That's food. So we, we're just really going to focus just on for the next six to nine months focusing on food. But one of the other things, we, we're at any one stage, we've got about 30 projects going around different parts different parts of the world. And the average project is about 100,000 US dollars a year per annum. So it's a reasonable, reasonable size. But we're found now that we've probably got about 25% of those projects are on hold because of the coronavirus in, in, in these various countries. That gives you an idea of just the impact which it's having just on even the you know, delivery of aid. So we're really trying to working with grassroots and really going to focus on Zimbabwe. We've got an office in Zimbabwe, so we put a lot of focus there because it's come out the back of a bad drought. It was already in the famine. We were already sort of feeding a uh, yeah, feeding people in Zimbabwe. So that'll be one of our major thrusts, as will as probably will be parts of India. So, uh, COVID nineteen is definitely like I'm. I'm glad that you're mentioning food because. Um, I am thinking about like and the humanitarian relief because it re reminds me of uh, natural disasters like when you have a shock in for example um, um, a country that has high levels of positive peace versus a country with low levels of positive peace. Um, I remember hearing you say somewhere that the the number even of deaths is um, is less by a measurable amount when uh, you are exposed to a shock like this. It could be a pandemic, it could be um, a natural disaster because you don't have the structures and systems in place. So what can we do? What can we learn from this shock to invest in positive peace um, and be more prepared in the future? So we are saving lives and helping people. Well, I think, so the first thing, it all starts with actually understanding what positive peace is mm -hmm. and then sort of, You've also got to, for each society, the inter interventions you do will be different because there's, with systems thinkers, there's this concept of path dependency. And it's a bit like me and you. Uh, you, you we're, we're on a timeline, we're born, our bodies grow, get old and we die. So, but society's all, so that's our path dependency, if you like. Uh, we can't, we, there's things we can do to change it, but the path is always there. Societies are somewhat the same in so much that they're on a path. So what you've got to do is look at where the society is at. So it's pretty silly looking at the, uh, the let's say, uh, the DRC in Africa and thinking that you're going to be able to do the same programs and get the same values and structures as what you've got, let's say, in Sweden. So what you've got to do is look at a society and where it's at. Uh, there's ways of being able to analyse it to determine what are the aspects which it's weak in, and this brings out a uh, yeah, positive piece. But we break that down to about 400 different basic metrics, which give you an idea then to be able to see what areas is the society improving in, what isn't it improving in, uh, uh, where does it need to uh, make it to uh, major interventions, which ones is it it's weakest on compared particularly to its neighbours, that gives you then a framework to be able to work with within that society. But you need to start from where the society's at, and that's the path dependency. Too often, we can come in from the West, move in to a society, and try and implement the values of our society. So now, now society, our values are good. I'm not complaining about our values, but they don't match with the values of the local society. And a lot of the time, programs just don't work just don't work. So a simple, simple example of that without getting into anything okay, too controversial, <laughs> yes I could, uh, 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 it'd be looking at a, uh, a project, look, a project we did in t Tanzania on the border of the uh, Burundi and the Congo, and this was about a decade ago. We poured two million dollars into this and made no difference and it's one of the poorest places in the world, like poverty is just unbelievable. And so what we did was decided to implement a program 
uh, to improve the nutritional uh, value of the crops because the, they had carb and stuff like that, which has got really low uh, nutritional value. So we implemented this program, worked at it for two years and it failed, totally failed. And what we didn't take into account was that the locals had a particular taste for food they liked. The crops we bought in, they didn't like that, simply didn't like the taste, or they wouldn't wow. eat. And so that's a bit, that's a bit like the path dependency. So what is the local diet, which they're interested in, which are the ones which will give them the sufficient nutritional value which they need. And now let's build out of that and then slowly introduce other crops which, uh, that, which they may not be used to, to build it over time. And that, that's, a, and that's a very, very simple and very, very basic example. That is a great example. Um, so Steve, given all these complexities, um, IEP is a, a leading think tank on measuring peace. So I was wondering what is um, IEP's biggest priority in light of COVID-19 and um, what do you anticipate the impact of COVID-19 on um, peace in general? Like what do you think or anticipate the results would be, whether positive or negative? Uh, right, so I think if we're looking, looking at our the, uh, priorities at the moment, uh, so one of the things we're doing, we're finding there's a lack of information out there on what people would be, uh, where the future is going. So there's a lot of immediate impact, where's all this heading? So we're putting out a weekly newsletter now, which anyone, uh, if your listeners can subscribe to, which uh, looks at future trends. So we scout news, put it into a short newsletter, which you can digest in, uh, yeah, in five minutes. So people can see what are the kind of trends which are emerging out of this. We break that up into five areas. So it's uh, a political, economic, development, conflict, and social. So that's, so that's one, of, one of the things we're currently doing. The second is we've got a series of research going on at the moment, which talks at positive peace and COVID-19. Uh, we'll be bringing out a paper on that in June, early June. That'll be the first part of it. We're basing it on what research we can see, see now. And what we can find is that the countries which are responding best and the countries with the lowest infection rates quite often are the ones with the couple of the some of the stronger pillars in uh, positive peace. So what positive peace in many ways, it's a measure of resilience. So you can see from that resilience, that's the ability of countries to be able to adapt and respond to crisis. So it's a good measure for a year of COVID-19. COVID so we're putting energy and work into that area, that area as well to bring, bring that out further. I think Governments at the moment uh, are yeah, globally are in, in reactive mode. Uh, one is the lockdowns, and they're, they're appropriate, but there are different approaches there. Sweden has put in very, very relaxed uh, uh, lockdowns, which surprised me. I thought they would have been pretty strict, but they weren't, compared to, let's say, it's uh, neighbours like Norway or Denmark. And so they're trying to uh, move through like the herd mentality to get the virus through the society and, and so the society becomes immune. That's causing a lot of deaths. So like you've got, I think, a bit over 2,000 deaths in Sweden compared to Norway, which is about 40 or 60. So there are different approaches for moving through this. Now, Australia uh, has got one of the uh, best records in the world. I was just looking at it this morning. We had just under 20 new cases reported yesterday and so this has dropped from a peak of the uh, something like 800 so we've got the back of it broken but What's your secret in australia why uh, you're yeah well it's got high levels of positive peace and you can see it play out because one is so you've got seven states so the st seven states and the federal government have come together and i've heard descriptions in the background that the discussions have been more like a brawl but <laughs> having said that, they've come together with a common policy, which they're implementing across the country. You then find major political parties have put aside their differences 
and they'll re-emerge when we come out of lockdown because then everyone will be criticising what could have been done better and what will be a, a, the future economic a, a policies. But during the crisis, they've come together. And so these are, we've got a, 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 a we're very good on equitable distribution of resources. And one of the key things for equity, equitable distribution of resources is looking at the health system. So a lot of the time people think equitable distribution of resources, everyone should get the same amount of pay. Uh, but that's really not what it's about. It's, it's sort of the base, it's, it's getting back to more the basics. So like everyone's got the, the opportunity to get good education, that people have got the, uh, a, 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 you've got a good health system. So Australia's got good health system, good education system. Uh, and Australians pretty much, although we complain about our governments a lot, uh, we've got trust in it. So you get the social dis distancing rules, people follow them. Uh, it's optional to work from home, but most people are working from home. So let's say at the, at the, in my family offices and at the, the Institute, what we've done is give them a flexible policy. People can work from home if they want to or come into the office. Most people are working from home. And a lot of them are doing that because they think it's the right thing to do so that you don't actually spread the virus. So they're yeah. the kind of things which come together in Australia. But I don't want to make it sound like Australia is a perfect society because when you're sitting inside any society, you generally see the warts on it rather than the, yeah, yeah, rather, rather than the beautiful features. <laughs> But I think you've alluded to this interesting concept, which is positive peace. Basically, we learn from people who are doing well. And like anything in life, if you want to do, uh, if you want to be a top athlete, you learn from the best. But when we are talking about, you know, peace, sometimes you only look at the violence, and that goes back to the beginning of our conversation. But back to your, back to your. Um, concept of like a measure, like the measures you're um, adopting in understanding the future trends are resilience. Um, and that is partially like in a way sustainability is part of that um, resilience, uh, which is a value um, that um, Rotary highly uh, adapts in their projects everywhere. So because of this, uh, Steve and the RAG, the IEP and the RAG are now providing future trends newsletter to everyone who's following this webinar and our members we will send you the first one as a, um, a follow-up to this webinar so steve would you like to um, say something about future trends newsletter to our audience sure yeah now we're all i've already sort of mentioned it earlier on uh, but as i said the aim of it is really to be able to try and get the facts out there which might give some pointer to where all this is going and give it in a really succinct form so you can read it so we've had the five areas so we've got the economics politics development uh, conflict and social and then the idea is to put in three to five points under each each of them consisting of one to two sentences and then quite often with a link to a, a bigger article if one wants to read it. So you can take it, pick up the gist of it and see where it goes. Now, this stage, when you're looking at the future trends, it's fairly negative. That's probably the best way, other than we're now starting to see the curve flattening in a number of countries in Australia, for example, being one, one, one of the better ones. Uh, but you can see a whole lot of economic pain now uh, coming up on the horizon. And so the idea is to capture that. It also captures the uh, other things which are, uh, may be of interest, uh, some positives which come out of this. So to some extent, and we can see part of it the, the, with announcements even overnight, is that the world's actually in some ways coming together better and otherwise is going to become more nationalistic. And so examples of it is the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the governments of the world through the WHO are going to start to share all the information uh, they've got on COVID-19, including uh, yeah, information on uh, the way trials are working, which normally you'd keep secret, secret because of the competitive issues, uh, but all that's going to be shared. So at one level, you're going to start to see countries coming together to cooperate 
more. So future pandemics, and they probably come. So future pandemics, what you're going to find there is that there'll be much better international cooperation and much earlier. So borders will be shut earlier, all sorts of other things. Now, at the national level, countries are now looking at supply chains and like particularly in the medical industry. So in normal times, you wouldn't think much about a 40 cent face mark being manufactured offshore. Now, in a crisis like this, when you can't get fibrillators and you can't get face marks, you now start to rethink the national supply chain, don't you? You really rethink it. Then you've got other countries, Japan and India, for example, now, which are in Japan's looking at re engineering its supply chain. It's paying Japanese companies to move out of China back to Japan or to other countries. And part of it is because they've built up too much dependency on China for the supply chain. India, on the other hand, now it's starting to pay countries to, or companies, I should say, to move manufacturing plants out of China into India. And so this is part of, so this is nationalism in many ways, but what it is, it's a response to having too much dependency on one place for a supply chain. This is, so there's all, all, all sorts of, all sorts of changes like this, this are going to. So. Other, 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 I'll give one more effect. Uh, so we've all heard about quantitative easing and very few people can actually get their head wrapped around it. But the idea of government issuing bonds, banks then buy those bonds, then the reserve bank buys the bonds off the bank, okay? Prints the money to buy the bonds off the bank. So it's something, and so it means you can just print money and uh, just keeps coming out and everyone's happy. But how long can this go on for? So this really started in a big way with the, uh, the global financial crisis. And it's one of the processes which has been used now and will gather pace, I imagine, over the next 18 months. So what happens is you print more money, you depress the interest rates. As you increase the flow, you depress interest rates. And we've seen that now been going on for the last 15 years. And we can see that the, the yeah, yeah, interest rates on money in banks in many parts of the world now have gone negative. So it all even accentuate through this. So if you think of this now moving further down to an extreme, can you imagine the bank paying you money so that you can take a mortgage out on your house? Mm. So there's something diabolically <laughs> wrong with it. Now also as you start to put the, make the cost of money cheaper, it gets a lot easier for people to borrow. So if we look at the last 15 years, we've seen boom in stock markets and property prices. So as money becomes cheap, where do you take the money and put it? Okay, in speculative investments, and most of them are non-productive. So building a new house is productive, but me investing in a house to a, uh, for the capital gains is non-productive. Similarly, in the stock market, so if a company lists with an IPR when you put money into it, that's productive. It's bringing more money into the company to invest, to grow its markets in productive ways. But if it's just riding the back of, a, uh, of an accelerating stock market, it's unproductive. So you've got all these things coming out of the back end which we can't grasp. Now, if you're printing money, to be able to print money, uh, that's fine because historically, we know that's always created hyperinflation. So why isn't it creating hyperinflation now? And that's simply because really what creates inflation a lot of the time is why increases in wages. Now, we know over the last decade, and it hasn't been true in the States for the last couple of years, but if we go back 30 years, it has been true. And in Europe for the last decade, the people's wages are actually a, a decreasing compared to the inflation of a lot of the, of, of, of the things which they need to buy. So, the only way to keep it under control is to keep wages suppressed. High levels of unemployment will suppress the wages, but what does that do for social discontent? Yeah. So we are definitely, from what you're saying, we're going to face 
we're facing a totally new problem. This is a problem we haven't faced before. Um, and the old policies and the old ways, probably we need to innovate even at that level, at the policy level, at the intervention level. Um, and being knowledgeable about what's going on is key for us to even be able to survive the next phase. Um, so Steve, I wanna change topics and uh, leave uh, uh, our conversation uh, before a Q&A at a inspirational note. So I know that you are a very a spiritual being and I know that the work you're doing is influenced by amazing uh, values. And one of the people who inspire you is the Dalai Lama. So I wonder um, why the Dalai Lama is inspiring to you. And if you can share with us the story that touched you um, that you've had with the Dalai Lama or something that really inspires you from him. Yeah, it's a, uh, hard to actually sort of put it into words and explain. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him now over the last 20 years or so. Uh, and, the man's got a presence, like an energetic presence, like I've never come across with anyone else I've met in my life. It's truly, truly profound. But I was up in the uh, Dharamsala uh, recently, uh, uh, attending a, a, a something put on there by uh, the US Institute of Peace. So what they've done for the last three years is they've brought in uh, 25 people from the various working conflict zones, young people, and by young people, 22 to about 32, let's say, 34, that age bracket, who are working in conflict zones, and who set up their own foundations to work for peace. And like we're talking about people who set, set up for things in like a lot of them are great risk in places like Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Lebanon, I think I said Lebanon, but on we can keep keep going places like that. And so none of them <coughs> got any background in Buddhism or much in the Dalai Lama. And so <coughs> over a period of the uh, three days, get to spend time with him. And these sessions are three and a half, three three hour, three hours in the morning, and then lunch with him afterwards. So the first day, <coughs> everyone gets the opportunity to ask. A question, and so just give you an idea of these questions. So one of them is uh, yeah, 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 saying, "Well, look, I'm working with this uh, group to try and stop conflict, but this group murdered my mother. Mm. How do I go about getting rid of the feelings I have about that?" So that's the second question. So like, like these, like, these are prof <laughs> profoundly profoundly difficult things. But the interesting thing with the Dalai Lama, it never answers a question directly. He'll use a parable or a story from his own life or something like that, but not directly touch on it. So he didn't touch on the direct, the, uh, the uh, direction of a mother. Uh, 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 he'll talk a little bit about the love of a mother and then might talk about uh, him uh, you know, building a compassionate heart be able to deal with problems moving through. So the first day you sit around and people ask their question and you're sort of just sitting in their seat. The end of the first day, they're leaning forward, listening to every word he was saying. At the end of the third day, they were crying. Wow, so they got in touch with their own. Oh um, yeah, yeah. His, his, his ability to be able to move the inner center of people is the uh, profound, just absolutely profound. Thank you for sharing. This is a powerful story and it, it shares with us the idea that everyone can start peace within themselves and by really facing those uh, questions, the difficult questions, uh, because peace is made of people, just like conflict is made by people. So for us to start peace and to build this chain, we need to be peaceful beings. Um, and that's the, the, the Dalai Lama's values that you take further in your uh, implementation of bigger projects in your think tank and uh, the people uh, you are around. So Steve, we have uh, future leaders and rotor actors and entrepreneurs, many people who are fascinated by uh, your journey. And I know that your journey doesn't come, um, didn't come easily. It, of course, it comes with its challenges and um, 
um, probably failures, probably um, uh, difficulties. So what were the most important lessons from your journey as an entrepreneur, philanthropist, um, uh, a change maker, uh, and a leader in our world that you can share with younger generation and future leaders uh, who would like to also have an impact on the world? What's your advice to them? What are the most important lessons that you've learned from this journey? Sure. Uh, so the first thing, you, you don't necessarily have to start with the best idea in the world. Yeah. Okay, that's a, that a lot of people think, ah, oh, the, 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 the idea is good, and everything else follows. But what happens is if you're adaptable, and you start with an idea which is good enough, it'll evolve and it'll work its way through. Okay, so that's the first first thing. Uh, don't think you've got to be have the uh, brightest idea which was ever done. The second thing is perseverance. So I can't underestimate how important perseverance is because often it's tough. Now, what happens is if you persevere, eventually windows open up, windows of opportunity open up, but they only remain open for a certain amount of time. So if you see one of those windows of opportunity, jump headlong first through it because it won't, won't stay open for too long, won't stay open for too long. Uh, the idea is bad, it doesn't matter how much you persevere, how much energy you put into it, it's not going to work. So it's a, the idea has to be right, but it doesn't have to be uh, perfect, and it just has to be a good enough idea. So what I think in a nutshell, that captures captures it. So a lot of the, this American saying, I used to earlier on in my business career, I used when the going got tough, I used to just keep repeating this little mantra, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I think from an entrepreneurial perspective too, we spend a lot of time on peace, uh, uh, but we live in a practical world. So in, you do, in, in the, the uh, yeah, peaceful can be the doormat for other people's dirty dirty feet, if you, if you get the idea of the expression. You don't want to be a doorman. So it is important to be robust, uh, is important to stand up for what you think. And quite often in a business environment, you do have to make tough to tough decisions on a, 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 on people. And But the idea is to do it, I think, with as compassionate a heart as possible. But that's sort of a, I guess, a Buddhist concept of compassion, which is a little bit different than the Western concept of compassion. So the Can Buddhist concept, yeah. sure, yeah. So the Buddhist concept of compassion is more about you can see the suffering in the other person and you want to, and you'd, you'd like to see it alleviated. The Western concept of compassion is you see the suffering in the other person, then the idea is to rescue them from it because sometimes you're suffering and you're suffering quite often is what you grow from. Yeah. Um, so life is, um, is, uh, is painful, but, um, and when we suffer, we can grow from that experience and we can um, have a choice to give up or continue to persevere and um, keep opening those windows. And it's, uh, life is a fun journey, so we should just enjoy the ride. And <laughs> uh, Steve, now it's time for uh, our Q and A. I will leave uh, the last question to the end. Um, before we transition to Q and A, I would like to take a moment to thank all the people who've signed up to our webinar. Um, it, thank you for making it a success and uh, for donating to be here. And if you're not a Rag for Peace member, please join because our goal is to expand the network of peace builders. So please continue to uh, invite your friends and, um, and your uh, fellow Rotarians and other peace builders to join this webinar. Next time, bring two or three, maybe five, and uh, just expand the program uh, to others. So now let's move to Q&A and see the questions. Um, I will start with David. In your Positive Peace Report 2019, you have a section on social resilience. Some might also worry about social resistance. Uh, do you have any ideas which, do you, which you think feel will be effective to change the current social resistance towards the v 
various pillars of positive peace. Um, so, yeah, so social, yeah, I'm not, not sure what David means by uh, social resistance. Yeah. So you can, you can look at civil resistance movements mm -hmm. and what we can find from civil resistance movements in highly peaceful societies, uh, uh, you tend to we, uh, have more of them. They exist for a shorter amount of period of time. Uh, they're more, uh, 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 they more like they're more moderate in their aims. They're more likely to achieve their aims, and they're far, far, far less violent. And that comes back to sort of the adaptability of the system. So the civil resistance, in some ways, like that, can be a peaceful demonstration, for example. Okay. Uh, uh, or it could be a, 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 a just strike to get away, just or something like that, just to, just to make a few up. Uh, so that tends to come around and sort of the, uh, build, build, a bit, build, build a better society because the society adjusts to take in the citizens' legitimate demands. And that's why civil resistance movements are more moderate because they don't have to get radical. Now, in systems which are a, got low positive peace, you'll find that the systems are more, a, they've got a thing called encoded norms, which means the systems have these encoded norms which keep it rigid in the inability to change. So an example of this would be Hong Kong. So you look at the demonstrations in Hong Kong, and it started off just about an extradition law of the uh, yeah, people charged with crimes in China can be taken from Hong Kong and put back in China. But the government sat tight and then you've got all these other pent up issues within the society and suddenly now that wasn't enough. They wanted a whole lot of other change as well. And this is, you see, I think this is where David's going with civil resistance. And now that's really built up over time and now it's exploded. So. The demonstrations are stopped now, but after the restrictions in Hong Kong are lifted, I imagine they're all going to come back. And that's because you've got a system which is rigid, incapable of adapting to change. So it doesn't make the little adjustments, and then that builds up a bit like a powder keg or a volcano or a, you know, or a bad, bad boil <laughs> and bursts. And uh, so, it's the adjustments along the way. So if you can improve the positive piece, you're more likely to make the adjustments along the way. So you don't have these uh, cataclysmic changes or you meet these tipping points which happen within societies. Like uh, yeah, you go to the Arab Spring, you go to Tunisia, one street vendor sets himself on fire because he can't get enough money to feed his family. And now that erupts into the Arab Spring. That's interesting, uh, which is a good follow-up question, um, I think, by Dennis. Uh, he asks, how could a country or region get to positive peace without achieving negative peace? Can you distinguish the diff, like, how? Yeah. No, that's great. Actually, that's a great question. So these things are cyclic. So if you're thinking of a system, positive peace feeds into the negative peace, and the negative peace feeds into the positive peace. So we all get... When you improve the positive piece, your negative and peace improves too. But if you move into conflict, that think about it. Think of a city, and, and the bad, this is a bad example, but I'll use it anyway because its positive piece was really poor. Syria, for example, or Libya. Okay. So when you move into conflict, what that does is stresses out a whole lot of other things in society, which then causes the positive piece to decrease even further. And then sort of you've got other societies where it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's on the decrease and then the positive peace decreases and if the negative peace is much higher than the positive peace, over time that negative peace falls back to what the latent values of positive peace, peace say it should be. So we put them into a, a models to try and forecast future falls in peace and we can look five to seven years ahead and we get, we get depending on the, the way you want to cut and slice that we get a 90 to about a, a, a near 70% accuracy rate on large falls in peace. That's really interesting. Um, I have a question from Nathan Thursk. He asks, 
It sounds like IEB has vast experience in its work with communities and governments in developing action plans towards furthering positive peace. Though each community or nation has its own unique factors, what do you think are some of the universal factors you have seen that move a society towards more or less peaceful situations? I think there's an, you need an open, you need the leaders of a society open to seeing that they need change. Okay, so we yeah. So one of one of the one of the countries we're talking with at the moment, and I'll pick up again after this is over, is Jordan. And so quite often what, what, what happens, and you'll find this quite in the European countries, find it in Australia or in the US, we think we're peaceful, okay? So we don't, the leaders aren't really open to change because they think they know it all and they're, they're there to teach the rest of the world. So I think the first thing is that you really got a leadership and which is open to new ideas and change. And a lot of the time that only comes about when you've got problems. So. Yeah. Yeah. why it is which is a great follow-up question by michael weaver he asks steve how can we use the elements of positive peace to build trust in a country that has a lack of credibility between the government and different parts of the population so if leadership uh, is key yeah. yeah yeah so this comes back to that concept of path dependency which i mentioned earlier on so if you really want to build it what you do is you don't look for radical changes so you take a government and I'll use corruption. So you take a government uh, which has got very, very poor tax revenues, so it hasn't got enough money to pay the police, the uh, education system, health system, uh, public servants appropriately, you'll get facility payments and corruption, okay? So the idea of going in and saying, we'll wipe out all corruption won't work. But you can focus on some areas of corruption. Within all societies, there's some areas which people see as being the corruption being obscene, particularly grand corruption, okay? Uh, uh, now, so the idea is with this concept of path dependency, what you need to do is do multiple small nudges to move the system in a direction. And so if you're looking at, let's say, the pillars of peace, you look at the eight things and what are multiple interactions you can do, which are small, but nudging the system in the right direction. What that means is if, something doesn't work then that's fine there are a whole lot of other things out there and you do get things working and once you get a system moving in a direction it's self-reinforcing it's a bit like your body so you get good exercise in right diet in you've got this self reinforcing good mental disposition you've got this self-reinforcing process if you go the other way and you're having 20 cans of coke a day you're not doing any exercise and all you're watching is horror movies <laughs> you end up in a different situation so societies are somewhat somewhat similar so when you get them right it's a, this a self-perpetuating cycle or what we'd call a, 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 a virtuous cycle so that, so what you need to do is just really focus on as many different interactions from as many directions as possible to actually stimulate the system. Great. So uh, now we have a more direct question from um, an attendee. Your discussion of Australia's and Sweden's comparative success in dealing with COVID-19 was intriguing in that it sounds like trust in its leadership and leadership's trust in people is very important to positive peace. How important is trust in maintaining positive peace in the sector of the various COVID-19 responses around the world, especially for the economically more vulnerable populations around the world? So, is yeah, it, a, yeah, yeah they're a, asking about specifically the COVID-19 and leadership. Yeah, yeah. So look, I think it comes back this is going to cause, as we move forward, all sorts of strains in different societies, uh, depending on the responses uh, which are made around COVID-19. Uh, so, look, in Australia, for example, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, he was in all sorts of dire political uh, 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 problems just prior to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, to the pandemic. His responses now is is riding on a his political capital is really high, so there wasn't so much trust in him, but there was trust in the system, and as the actions have happened, they've happened in a timely manner, 
well before people are demanding it. And I think that in this situation, that had a lot to do with it. But trust is something which is uh, yeah, built up over long periods of time. It's not, and sort of, I think you're going to find a lot of changes in leadership as we come out of the back end of this. Whether it feels the rise of new political parties. So in Europe, you've seen the, the use of the word populist parties, but they're, they're really more uh, yeah, yeah, parties which are uh, appealing to the people for uh, change. So if you look in the US, for example, uh, if we look at President Trump, uh, whether he, what you think of him, uh, like him or dislike him, the reality is he came out of a dysfunctional system where people were looking for change. So if we look at the Republicans, they never wanted Trump as their candidate. Uh, they did everything they could for a long while uh, uh, to disempower him. But the, uh, yeah, the, the, the members of the Republican Party in the end voted for him as they're looking for change. They're really looking for change. And so, so I think the area of trust, uh, this will fill over in all sorts of ways around the world in all sorts of countries in many, many different ways. So the, a lot of authoritarian governments, what they'll do is they'll just double down on the, uh, uh, the repression which they're using. Other countries which have got a, a, a democracies, but maybe not perfect democracies, but they have got a reasonably fair elections, you're going to see all sorts of changes going on. And some of it will be towards a, 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 to the right, some of it will be to the left, uh, uh, others will be towards new, new, new political platforms and such. So yeah, it's a, no, that wasn't a great answer, but it's... it's no, anything you say, Steve, is, I think, informative because you're speaking from different lenses and uh, your measures. So I think it adds value to any question. So perfect. Um, I want to ask, there's not me, like uh, uh, an uh, attendee is asking, is IEB looking at measuring the impact of climate change on peace? And if so, how are you looking to do this? Gee, who asked that question? I don't know. They, they, I don't know. They're, they it's have an a number. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. okay, that's right. Yeah, I think in last year's GPI, yeah, we did last year's GPI. We put out a small bit on uh, climate. So where we're going on that? See, so we're looking at. We're in the process now of developing what we call an ecological threat register. We haven't turned it into an index because I think it's very dangerous to say this is the country in the world which is going to have the worst ecological impact. So we're turning it into a register rather than a, an index. So what we're doing is we're looking at a range of different things. So we're looking at the availability of uh, yeah, yeah, free water on the fresh water. We're looking at the food security. Uh, we're looking at the, the economic conditions of the country. And a lot of that just has to do with the levels of debt. We're looking at population growth. And then we're looking at factors of climate change, which can be drought, salinity through rising, rising water levels, uh, bigger cyclones and, uh, and such. Now we're combining that with positive peace. So we now have got the ability to be able to look at the resilient levels of different societies with the aim of being able to pick the societies which are gonna have the most impact from these uh, uh, changes, which I've just said and also the level of resilience to be able to cope with these changes as well. And so as we look down at, we've got the basic register there at the moment, uh, if we look down at, you do find that the countries with the higher levels of positive peace have the uh, yeah, better, better coping capacities currently. Uh, but that makes sense because you've got this strong relationship with the capita income and positive peace, and that then gives them money to be able to do a whole lot of different adaptive processes which other countries can't. So food, for example, is we, we, we believe that's the food security is going to be one of the big things as we move forward into the uh, future, as, as is the uh, uh, fresh water. So they're, they're, they're two of the areas we, we think is incre incredibly important. But if you're a rich country, Singapore would be an example, uh, you, or Q8, you may not be able to grow enough food, but you've got the resources to import the food. So you have got the food security. 
But if you go down to some parts of the world where you've got a 3% per annum increase in population, so that means every decade your population is going up by over a third. Think of, th 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 think of that. Think of the uh, taking uh, Seattle and increasing the population of the uh, Seattle or Portland. Take the population of Portland, think of increasing that every decade by 30%. And now multiply that out for a few years and like, it's, it's almost it's almost impossible. And then you take countries which are overpopulated already and with high levels of debt, they're just the problems are just going to be uh, going to be horrific. But you can identify the places uh, uh, where these problems are going to be worse. And we're taking this study out to 2050. That then gives the ability to know where we need to be able to put the actions in. And so we're also then looking at what are the type of programs which are best capable of being, and a lot of them are, are ecological uh, yeah, projects, which are best capable of being able to adapt to these changes which are going to impact us in the future. So Steve, we have three questions left that I think we can cover. Um, the first one is from Marcel. Um, he asks, don't you think that it could be interesting to compare how a set of countries currently meet the 2030 objectives of sustainable development OSD and how they perform towards the eight pillars of positive peace to see and possibly demonstrate the correlation between building positive peace and meeting the OCDs. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So we've got a report uh, called SDG 16 and that looks at the, <coughs> the relationship between SDG 16, which is the, uh, yeah, Peace and, peace, and, peace, peace and governance uh, goal under the SDGs. Uh, and certainly we went back and looked at the Millennium Development Goals because you've got enough history there to be able to look at it. And certainly the stronger positive peace is, the more likely they have been to achieve the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Not enough data there yet to be actually be able to do the uh, proper analysis on the Sustainable Development Goals. But one of the issues with the Sustainable Development Goals is 169 targets. Now that's an awful lot of targets. So even the, uh, the chief statistician in Germany said we can't meet all those targets. It's the and, and uh, ad adequately uh, work towards meeting all those targets. So what that means is is then a need to be able to pick which targets do you prioritise, and so. So really, uh, you'll find governments, many governments, are just going to be tempted to take the easy winners, show how good we've done, uh, uh, or alternately, fudge the figures. And so that's obviously not going to happen in the Western democracies, but you get down to some of the uh, more authoritarian countries, uh, and the, you, you just can't trust the stats because the official measurements of the SDGs come back what the governments say, uh, say they have achieved. So I think, and the money's just not going in there, going into it. I find when I get outside of, let's say, uh, yeah, civil society, which I'm mixing in, I get into my business environments and places like that, or just up at my uh, local golf club, or mates I go surfing with or something like that. Most of them never heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. And so I think the, the issue is I think, the uh, your major governments, they're cutting back on their uh, overseas developmental aid uh, rather than increasing it. So Australia, for example, it's almost entirely wiped out its overseas developmental aid. It's putting some into the Pacific, but that's basically about it. They're putting the money into other things like a uh, defence. Very interesting. And you're finding that more and more countries, are, uh, the donor countries are doing that in Around uh, around the world, so I think the sustainable development goals, in uh, many ways, were too broad in the first place, and, and the no one really thought where the money was going to come from to really make it work. So that's but, not, not, but I think conceptually they're great, absolutely great. Mm -hmm. So I, if you can address this question quickly, like maybe a minute. Um, how do you prevent conflicts of sitting priorities between the different pillars of positive peace? How do you keep all of them in balance? So Sorry, repeat the question again. How do you prevent conflicts 
of setting priorities between different pillars of positive peace. So, so someone is assuming that the positive pillars are kind of priorities rather than systems. Um, how do you keep all of them in balance? So there's a few different ways. One is like, if you're looking at the pillars of positive peace, if you've got one which is massively down, or one or two of them which are massively down, they're the ones you focus on. The other thing is if you're looking at the pillars and you can see some are improving uh, and have been improving over time, then you probably don't have to do too much with it. But if you've got others which are deteriorating, uh, even though they may be reasonable levels now, that's another area where you have to look at Classic example of that's Mexico. So we all know Mexico well, uh, and we're just bringing out the Mexico Police Index now. It'll probably be released in a couple of weeks. I think it's next week it's getting released. But homicide rates now are historically high levels. They've just gone through the roof yet again. And that's all comes back to the, uh, uh, the wars between the various uh, 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 drug cartels down there and between the government and the cartels. And so, and it's got the, one of the highest, it's probably got the highest rate of murder of journalists anywhere in the world as well. There, something in the last 12 months, there's something like 120 attacks on politicians, a number of them where they were killed. So it's, a, like, it's a phenomenally violent. But if you look into the uh, your positive piece and the overall positive piece, it would predict that Mexico should be about 40 places higher on the Global Peace Index than what it is. But when we look at one indicator, corruption, then we dig down further inside that, particularly inside the police and judiciary, it's incredibly low, incredibly low. And so if they can solve their issues with corruption within the police and judiciary, and also also government, because it flows over there as well, you'd find that uh, you get a get a much, much uh, better uh, uh, result. So really that's where, where you, but it's not easy. Like once you get entrenched corruption, getting rid of it is exceptionally difficult. So Steve, one uh, last question from the audience. Um, how can, uh, from actually our chair, uh, Alison, uh, she asked, how can the Rag for Peace community uh, help you in what you're doing? So the community of Rotarians, um, the Rag for Peace members, the Peace Voter Clubs, how can they help you in what you're doing right now? Well, I, well simply, I think we've got this relationship with Rotary, which is around positive peace. So we created the, in conjunction with Rotary, we've created the a, a Positive Peace Academy. So it's a simple training course. It consists of four modules. Uh, it's about 40 minutes a module. Propagate that, push that out, through your various note rotary networks. And I think that's, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's a great start. I think there's a lot of action with inside of intent inside rotary now to try and do more projects, which are seen as peace projects. And so the positive peace in some ways can take the six different thrusts of rotary, and bring them together under one banner. Because if you think back to, let's say the example of the literacy project, that's just, a, it, classic ordinary development project. So it does give away now being able to take all the projects which uh, Rotary does and bring them together uh, under one banner, under positive peace, and then broaden the way you look at the projects, broaden the way you look at the projects. I think the idea of, with now, with the uh, Rotary, we're in the projects process of training a, a, a activators, uh, uh, rotary activators around the world. It's been put a little bit on hold because of the uh, lockdowns. But we're in the process of training something like 400 people. We've, all been, uh, we've also got uh, some, we've got about 2,000 IEP ambassadors, but about 700 of them uh, rotary peace fellows. So we've got about 50% of the rotary peace fellows trained. So it's how do you take that network and activate it? How do you get relationships between developed Rotary clubs and clubs in the developing world to fund projects, which are developmental projects, which you do anyway, but put it through the lens of positive peace, which now means you're just taking what you're doing anyway, turning it into a peace project as well. But it does give you a framework so you can look at it systemically and hopefully 
you get those uh, you hit it out of the ballpark results like we saw with the uh, literacy project in uh, Uganda. Absolutely. Um, so basically, Rotarians can pay more attention to the positive pillars in the design of their projects. Uh, they can connect the Peace Fellows uh, who are activators or uh, IEB ambassadors with the Rotarians and the Rotary Clubs so they can spread the message and spread um, the ideas of positive peace to Rotarians. Steve, I would like to end yeah, with... Just, just, just one, one more thing on it. Like the uh, yeah, peace rags, an incredibly important uh, yeah, yeah, pillar, if you like, in terms of the yeah, promoting peace through Rotary. And look, yeah, 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 I, I, look, I think it's a, just incredibly important. I think the work everyone does on it is a, really important. And, Certainly for me, it's got a lot of resonance, uh, yeah, yeah, resonance with my heart anyway. That's awesome. Um, Steve, I want to ask you what kind of impact you would like to leave um, the world with? Uh, what is the impact you would like to have on the world? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a sort of personal question. I get that one a lot. And the other one is what motivates me and I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I, just, I just do. So, but put it another way, it's a, a, I don't myself really need to leave any impact. Uh, but what I would like is that the work which I've done has a, a, a process of helping to create a more peaceful world in the future, which is pretty obvious. But for me, it's, a, it's not so much a personal legacy, it's more the legacy of the work which one does, which carries on. Because it's back to the path dependency is it you create a certain vibration and vibration moves through society and carries along on long after uh, we're dead so for me sort of that vibration which i'm creating is around creating more peaceful societies and so the work we're doing now really is cutting edge that that, that, that horizon will have moved and other people will build off the back of what uh, we've done and create a better and greater work further down. And to quote Albert Einstein, uh, I've only done what I've done because I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. And so it's this progression, if you like, of society and it's this path dependency, it's just it's moving down a path. So what I'd like is the vibrations which I've created do feel a, uh, others which then take it and move it and move it further on. And if I'm forgotten, that's fine, because it just means it, it, things have uh, yeah, progressed so, so much further. Steve, um, you, are, you bring very positive vibrations to everyone who encounters you. And obviously the work of IEB has touched many people around the world, including me and um, our staff and our audience. Um, and um, your humility and dedication and hard work and who you are is refreshing and inspiring. So I would love to thank you for joining us today. And oh, this is our picture from Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Yeah. And oh, I. Hi, right. just here's one. So, so that how I'm leaning my head on your head. Uh -huh. I picked pick that up from a Buddhist monk. Every time he'd, uh, he'd someone to take a photo with him, he'd lean his head on it. And it was such a nice feeling. I've started to do it. It comes up well as a photo, doesn't it? It does. It, it shows like how you are impacting the people who are close to you because change starts within us and then we take it to the people around us and then it goes to the world. Like you said, the vibration, we should have the right vibration if we want to spread, uh, spread it um, out. So Steve, I want to thank you for uh, making our webinar extra special today and for all the ideas, amazing ideas you've shared with us and your valuable time. Um, thank that you. That was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Have a great yeah, day. Right. Yeah, no, I will. Bye-bye.